Well, good morning, church family. It's so good to be with you again, and it's especially good to be able to celebrate baptisms this morning, and doing that in a real… you can clap for that. That's a wonderful thing to celebrate the new life that Jesus gives, and to be able to do it in this room, which is a neat opportunity. Uh, I don't know how long it's been since baptisms were able to have been done in this room, but to be able to have this set up this morning so that we could have the candidates right here with you and you could see them instead of on the video screen and to be able to be a part of celebrating what Jesus has done in their life. As Baptists, this ordinance is of a special importance. Uh, this is a reminder to us all. Uh, one time in our life this is done, but it's a reminder to us all that Jesus has died for sin and was raised from the dead and that as an individual we place faith in Him and, and as this symbolically shows, are buried with him in the likeness of his death and raised in the likeness of his resurrection to walk in a newness of life that Jesus has given. What a precious and amazing event this is. And we're here to celebrate it with Elizabeth Ramsey, our first candidate this morning. I want to read to you her testimony so that you can hear how she came to know Jesus Christ. Elizabeth writes, I grew up in a faithless home. I hadn't realized what religion was until I was an adult. When I was 25 in Miami, a lady approached me as I was reading the Bible and taught me that I was born a sinner and I needed to repent of my sins and ask Jesus into my heart. I did. I prayed every night and asked God to help me find a Christian godly man. My prayers were answered when I was sent to Alaska to work on a small cruise ship. My future husband was also working on that cruise ship. Since that summer of 2017, my faith has grown and gotten stronger. I'm excited to keep growing stronger in my faith and to continue to grow in my relationship with God after today. Elizabeth, have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ and Him alone for salvation? And based upon your profession of faith, Elizabeth, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, dead and buried in the likeness of his death, and raised to walk in the likeness of his resurrection. Amen. You. You're welcome. Well, it is uh, always a joy as a pastor to baptize anyone, but to baptize your son has special significance. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is Noah Cannell, our fourth born son, and uh, Noah has been waiting patiently to be baptized, very patiently, and you'll hear from his testimony just how patient he's been. Noah writes, growing up in a home of ministry, I heard about salvation at a pretty young age. But it was one night in first grade when I asked Jesus to save me. My dad helped me understand what it meant, and I prayed a prayer that night, asking God to forgive me of my sins and save me. It took me a few years to know what being saved really meant. I'm learning how to grow, and God helps me each and every day. Well, it's been a few years since he was in first grade, as you can tell. And uh, he has uh, waited for his uh, dad to uh, not only just be sure that that understanding was set, but then also work out a schedule where I could baptize him and lead worship. Uh, and that day has come today, and I'm thankful for that. So I am uh, very grateful for my son this morning to be making public his profession of faith. So Noah, have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ and him alone for salvation? Yes. And based upon your profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death and raised in the likeness of his resurrection to walk in newness of life. And while we're at it, I have another son here who is going to be baptized. Thank you. This is the last. We're not doing all seven today. <laughs> so you know I'm thankful for my children. Uh, John wrote in his epistle, I have no greater joy than to know 
my children are walking in the truth, and that is so incredibly true about a parent. And to see this happen is very meaningful to Mary and me. Jonathan writes, before I came to know Jesus, I was living a life that didn't have any meaning. I was not glorifying and worshiping God for what he had done and what he could do. I was saved in the fifth grade. I had prayed the prayer of salvation many times, but one of those times I was convicted, and when I prayed, it meant something that I had not realized before. I realized what it meant to be saved and why I needed to ask for forgiveness. I'm glad I can say that I know I am saved by Jesus Christ and that he has made a way through darkness for me to provide me with eternal life and, more importantly, a way to be with him. Jonathan, have you trusted in Jesus Christ and him alone for salvation? Yes. Then, based upon your profession of faith, Jonathan, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Buried in the likeness of his death and raised in the likeness of his resurrection to walk in the newness of life. Well, now let's give our attention to the screen as our choir and orchestra help us prepare to worship him and respond to him this day.
morning and welcome to First Baptist. Whether you're joining us online or whether you're here in person, it's so good to have you. Today's a very special day. Uh, I talked to uh, many people on the way in this morning and it was their first time back uh, with us and uh, <laughs> praise the Lord for that. Uh, today's been special uh, and it's just getting started. We've had uh, an awesome baptism time. Uh, we had Sunday school for adults back for the first time in months. Praise the Lord. Uh, if you're joining us uh, for the first time, whether that be online or whether that be here in person, uh, we would like to connect with you. There's a, a link you can go to on the website, uh, fbcjacks.com slash connect. We would love to connect with you there and learn how we could pray for you, uh, learn how we could uh, minister to you. And so if you would go there, uh, we'll have more information at the end of the service about that. Our mission is to reach all of Jacksonville with all of Jesus for all of life. Uh, and today, as we worship, we want to make much of him. We've been doing that through baptism, uh, and we want to do that through song and through the preaching of his word. Uh, but before that happens, let me pray for us. Father, we come to you, and we want to thank you for uh, this special day, Lord, where many people are back for the first time, where uh, three people were baptized and represent uh, and remind us of the wonder that Jesus Christ would come to rescue sinners, Lord. We wanna make much of Jesus today. Lord, your word teaches us that Jesus, that, by, uh, that all things, all things were created by him, Lord. And today we wanna to acknowledge Christ as creator. Father, your word teaches us that Christ uh, not only created all things, but that all things were created for him. Lord, help us to make much of him today. Your word teaches us, Lord, that Christ is the head of the body, the church. Lord, we desire, we desire that we would be led by Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Your word teaches us, Father, that he will have first place in everything. Lord, help First Baptist Church to be the church where Jesus comes first. And Lord, your word teaches us that Christ has reconciled all things to himself through his blood. And so today as we sing, as we hear your word preached, help us, Lord, to have hearts that are open to seeing the death and the resurrection of Jesus on our behalf and help us to make much of him. And we ask it in his name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Cody. You know, with all that is going on in our world these days, it can be discouraging to think about what the state of the kingdom is. But then when you recognize that God is still saving people and getting, they're getting baptized and uh, he's still at work, you recognize that the invisible kingdom marches on. And there is no end because there is no end to the king. He is eternal. I want to remind you of these words from 1 Timothy chapter 6 as we call to worship the congregation this morning. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who testified the good confession before Pontius Pilate that you keep the commandment without stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ which he will bring about at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. That's the king that we worship this morning, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, to him be eternal dominion. He is the eternal king. Let's worship the king and stand as we sing, church.
Please remain standing as Jamie Vaughn comes to lead us in our scripture reading this morning. Please join me in reading Zechariah 12, 10. I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication so that they will look on me whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. It is a joy to gather together this morning, and we have many things that we can be praying for, uh, for our church family. We are in a season of 40 days of prayer for spiritual power, and uh, there are things we can be praying for. Uh, One of them are uh, people in our congregation who need uh, health. Uh, We have sick members, and uh, one of them this morning uh, wanted to be here. Uh, Pastor Heath uh, was scheduled to be here. I was scheduled to preach, and he was going to help with the baptism uh, this morning and worship together, but his family is not doing well. Uh, they're fine. It's uh, a sinus infection. Don't, don't fear. It doesn't uh, look like anything more serious, but uh, he's at home, and so you can be praying for him. And we could, I've also, many of you have been praying for Mrs. Nancy Sullivan, and she is doing better. She is off the ventilator and doing well. And so that is a great prayer. In fact, Dr. Sullivan was here earlier. I don't know if he's still here this morning or not, but he was here, and he was, I heard he was dancing in the dining room because uh, Sunday school was back. So if you see him dancing, you'll know uh, he's a happy camper this morning. We can be praying for folks who need uh, to heal from sickness. Uh, we can also be praying uh, for dependence upon the Lord. And the thing that uh, I feel burdened about this morning in particular is we want more people to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We want more people in Jacksonville to be saved. We want more people to come and be discipled and enter the waters of baptism. And so I want to ask that we would pray for that in particular this morning. And then this this is also the time of our service where we give. And uh, we, there's several ways you can give. You can give online, you can give by mail, or you can give on your way out. And uh, many of you uh, have been faithfully, faithfully giving and have sustained the church. And I'm so, so grateful. And uh, we want to thank you for that and ask God to bless the offering and the tithes that you are giving to our church. So let's go, go to the Lord in prayer and do that right now. Heavenly Father, We are in a season of prayer, and we want to thank you for Mrs. Sullivan, who is recovering, and we want to pray for the Lambert family, that you would bless them as they're worshiping online at home. We want to pray for many others in our congregation who need strength and healing and peace and rest. We want to ask that as we seek to reach all of Jacksonville, with all of Jesus for all of life, that you would give us many more baptisms. Not just so we can have a number, but so that we can see people worship the King. That we would see people have serious joy in worship as we have this morning. And Father, I thank you for all of the gifts and tithes and offerings that our church has so faithfully given. I pray that you would bless them I pray that you would make us cheerful givers and that you would cause your face to shine upon us so that every tribe and tongue would know your great name. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The most remarkable part of the story of the king and his kingdom is that the king would lay down his life for the subjects in the kingdom. And that not just subjects, but those who had willfully rebelled against the king. But he would give his life so that they could be subjects again. They could be members of the family of God again. We're going to sing of this love, how deep the Father's love for us that was expressed by this king for us. Let's stand as we sing. Yeah. 
Please be seated. This is a wonderful, wonderful thing. We have an opportunity to gather together as the people of God and behold our God as a congregation, as a church. He took away our sin and gave us his righteousness and he rose from the dead, proving victory. And that's how he showed his grace to us. To be made right with him, to receive forgiveness of sins is possible when you believe and you confess him as Lord. And that means that you say, God, I'm tired of living with me at the center and I want you to be my Lord and I want to turn from my sin and I want to trust in you and I want to submit my life to your law and submit my life to your word and that is what it means to be a Christian. You have the same power in your life to share the gospel that Jesus Christ had in his life. You've got infinite power. You just don't see it. You don't believe it. Believe it. Believe Jesus gave you a gift to preach the gospel. The power that Jesus had is the power that we have when we believe and Jesus used the power to preach and be a witness and we are to use the power and preach and be a witness as well. Well, if you have a copy of God's Word, turn to the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, chapter 1, we will be reading Revelation 1, 3 through 8 this morning. Here is what the Holy Spirit revealed to the Apostle John, starting in verse 3. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood, and he made us to be a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Let's pray. Father, this is a powerful text and I ask boldly that this text this morning and this sermon would jumpstart our hearts and would reorient our lives. I ask that it would be a jolt that we would remember and that would impact the rest of our days. I ask that we would live in light of the reality that your son Jesus Christ is coming and he is coming quickly. Father, I pray if there are any who are listening to my voice, whether they are here in the room or they're watching online and they don't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, that today would be the day of salvation and that they would hear about your second coming, and it would jolt them to life. And I pray for anyone who is a Christian but is apathetic or lazy or drifting, that it would jolt them as well, and that you would encourage the saints because of this word. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. In 1925, 
in a town in Alaska called Nome, there was an epidemic that took place. Many of you are familiar with the story. It's the 1925 called the Serum Run. And this epidemic took place, and it was an epidemic of diphtheria. Diphtheria was breaking out in the town. There was about 1,400 people in the town, and children were starting to die. Diphtheria, thankfully, has almost been eradicated thanks to vaccines. But back then, it was very, very serious, and it was called the strangling angel. And if a child was infected with it, uh, they were most susceptible because it uh, makes your lung, it makes your throat swell, and it's, it suffocates you, it's difficult to breathe. And it doesn't just infect children, it was uh, endangering the entire town. And the town of Nome knew they were in trouble. There was a doctor named Curtis Welch. He was the only doctor in the town. And he sent a telegram back to the mainland, if you will. So, uh, Trevor, that's uh, Trevor's phrase, the mainland, because he's from Hawaii. So, they're in Alaska. <laughs> no offense, Trevor. Um, they sent a telegram back, and here's what he says. An epidemic of diphtheria is almost inevitable here. I'm in urgent need of one million units of antitoxin. Mail is the only form of transportation. The city was locked. They were locked in because the ice in the harbor. They couldn't have ships bring it. There was a storm that was coming, which it wound up being such a significant storm that it impacted not only Alaska, but all the way to New York City and froze the Hudson River. And that storm prevented airplanes from coming because it was open cockpit at that time, and the temperature would freeze the water in the plane. So the only thing they could come up with was dog sledding. And they assembled a team of dog sledding and mushers, a team of relays that would take place over 600 miles to the nearest city where there was medicine, which was Anchorage. And they had 20 teams back to back that would relay. It would take about 12 days. And that was the only hope to save this town. If you know the story of Togo and Balto, the famous dogs, then you know how it ends. You know that the city was rescued and they cut the time in half. They, they charged into the storm. They, these men and these animals risked their lives, and they traveled through this relay, and they saved the town and the children because they knew there was a deadline. There was a deadline that their children and their families depended upon. They didn't know when the deadline would happen, but they knew that every second counted and every minute was required for their utmost urgency to get this serum, to get this medicine from Anchorage. Deadlines are meant to impact us. They're meant to change us. If you're a student, you know a deadline can make you pull an all-nighter. Uh, Chandler at my house, uh, when he hears the trash truck, he uh, yells, trash, trash. And uh, if we haven't put the trash out, we run out and we put the trash can. Because if we miss the deadline, then that trash is going to pile up for weeks. Deadlines, whether small or big, they have an urgency that they put upon us. And this morning, I want to talk about the ultimate deadline, the, the most significant deadline that we're facing, and that deadline is the return of Jesus Christ. And so I want to give us seven lessons about the second coming. The King is coming, and there are seven lessons this morning that we need to hear from Revelation 1. Now, by way of disclosure, I am not pretending to be an expert in the book of Revelation. So, uh, I'm not going to get into all the nitty-gritty details and all the controversial issues. If you have questions about eschatology, you can save that for Pastor Heath when he comes back on vacation. But until then, I want to focus on things that everyone, whether you're a scholar or not, you have to know about the second coming. So, if you're taking notes, here's the main point. The main point is this. The king is coming, and we 
must live like it. The king is coming, and we must live like it. Look at verse 3. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. Lesson number one, the king blesses obedience. The king blesses obedience. When you begin to talk about the end times, maybe your mind drifts to things that are a little strange, like people wearing billboards and people that haven't bathed and they're having bullhorns on the side of the street. Eschatology, the the study of the end times, has a way of piquing our curiosity and captivating our imagination. And that is good and fine. But Revelation starts out with a warning for us. The book of Revelation and the end times and the return of Jesus is not primarily to entertain us for our curiosity and our intellectual sakes. The book of Revelation and the second coming is meant to push us to obedience. It's meant to push us to love Jesus more and to have our character conformed into His holiness and to His likeness. That's what it says in verse 3. Blessed are those who heed the things which are written in it. Don't just be a hearer of the Word. Don't just like that Jesus is returning. Don't just think about charts and diagrams and get all the details lined up. Jesus wants you to be impacted. He wants you to be different. He wants your faith to increase. He wants your fruit to be fruit of the Spirit, and that should come by reading and thinking about the return of Jesus. So, in 2020, there's all kinds of things that feel apocalyptic. And when you see the memes on Facebook about the murder hornets and all these things that are coming, that's fine to think about the seventh trumpet and the fifth trumpet in the book of Revelation, but you should think first and foremost, am I looking like Jesus Christ in my personal life? Am I telling others about His second coming? Am I telling others that Jesus died for their sins and rose bodily from the grave, and just as He went up in the air, so He's also coming? The blessing of Revelation, it's been said, is to see things as they will be clearly. We are the people who know the King is coming And that's just not for the future in our curiosity. That's right now for us to look more like Jesus and to proclaim His gospel. So, first lesson, here's the question. Does the second coming impact you today? Are you living like Jesus is coming back? The second lesson, the king has the final word. This is the second lesson from Revelation. The king has the final word. Look at verse 4. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and him who was and him who is to come and from the seven spirits that are before the throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. 2020 has not taken Jesus by surprise. Jesus has the final word on the pandemic. Jesus has the final word on the election. Jesus has the final word on the economy. Jesus has the final word on our church. Jesus is described as the ruler of the kings of the earth. Look at it. Look at how he's described. From him who is and who was and who is to come. God has outlived every human being. God never stops existing. God created everything. He is before us, and He is now, and He will be forever. This is deeply encouraging. God has the final word on your life and my life. The Trinity is described here, I believe. God the Father, and then you have 
the seven spirits, I believe that's a reference to the Holy Spirit. Seven is a significant number in the Bible. It's also a significant number in the book of Revelation. It's the number of fullness, number of completeness, perfection. And if you get tired of my sermon here, I have seven points. And so you just know it's the perfect number. So hang in there. If uh, number six doesn't do it for you, there's seven coming. The Holy Spirit is mentioned here. And then Jesus is described directly. He's addressed directly, and it says, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. The book of of the Revelation describes the divinity of Jesus in crystal clear terms. If you're talking to someone and they don't believe the divinity of Jesus Christ, take them to the book of Revelation. He is addressed directly and worshiped directly as God, as the King of kings, and his reign is unmatched. And then skip down to verse 8. God is described as the Alpha and the Omega, who was and is and is to come, the Almighty. Alpha is the first letter in the Greek alphabet. Omega is the last letter. So he is from A to Z, and he's not just A and Z. He's every single letter in between, all the way down. God has the final word. So First Baptist, are you living in light of this reality? Are you living with hope that God has the final word? Are you living free of fear and anxiety that God is on the throne of history? That's the second lesson. The third lesson is the king wants faithful witnesses. The king wants faithful witnesses. Look at verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. Jesus, the coming king, is described here as the faithful witness. Now, as with most books in the Bible, the first couple of chapters are significant for the rest of the, cha- rest of the chapters in the book. And there are themes that John lays out here in Revelation 1 that are carried throughout the book, and this is one of them. The faithful witness. We see this again mentioned in chapter 2. We see this with the two witnesses that are mentioned later on in the book. We see this in Revelation 17, where the woman is drinking the blood of the faithful witnesses. God wants us, you and me, to follow in the footsteps of His Son, who is the faithful witness. This is the text that that Scott read earlier. When Jesus was before Pontius Pilate, he made a good confession. He was a faithful witness. When we are baptized, that's our profession of faith, and we boldly tell the world that we are followers of Jesus. And Jesus wants us to keep that witness all the way to the end. Look at Revelation 2. Look at 2 verses 12 and 13. The same term is described of Antipas, a Christian, is described of him as my faithful witness. Look at verse 12 in chapter 2. And to the angel at Pergam write, the one who has a sharp two-edged sword says this, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast my name and did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, my witness, my faithful one who was killed among you where Satan dwells. This is stunning. Jesus says there's a city where Satan's throne is, and there's a faithful witness there who's following in my steps. There's a place that's satanic where Satan lives, and yet someone's faithful. First Baptist, is Satan alive and well in Jacksonville? He is. Is our country slipping into moral debauchery faster and faster every day? Yes. Yes. Uh, Is our culture decaying as we speak? Yes. But that means we need to be more faithful, not less faithful. That means we need to follow in the footsteps of our Lord and Savior and King who stood under immense pressure and was a faithful witness to His God and our God. That's That's the lesson for us. Lesson three. Lesson four 
is the king has guaranteed victory. The king has guaranteed victory. <clears throat> Perhaps you say, Sean, I was with you until you talked about that city where Satan dwells and being faithful to the end and the woman drinking the blood of the faithful witnesses. I don't know about that. I don't know if I have enough faith for that kind of persecution. Well, the lesson number four is that our king has already guaranteed victory in his first coming. The first coming guarantees the victory of the second coming. Look at verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead. What does that mean? Firstborn? But being born is life? Firstborn of the dead? Dead is death? What, what is that? It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make sense unless you have a resurrection. And when you have a resurrection, you have someone who's the firstborn of the dead. And what that means is when Jesus rose from the dead, He guarantees that you and me, when we're trusting in Jesus, we will resurrect from the dead. The first coming, the gospel, the life, death, and empty tomb of Jesus guarantees the victory of the second coming that mission has already been accomplished. He's just carrying it on through. And that should cause yours and my faith to soar. But look, it's even better than that. Look at verse 5 again. From Jesus Christ the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. That's the victory of the first coming. It's in the present tense, Jesus' love. Think about that. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. He loves you, and then it's in the past tense, He freed you. He released you. This means Jesus frees us from both the penalty of sin and the power of sin. We're freed from guilt, and we're free to obey Him. Jesus doesn't just save us from our sins, He transforms us to walk in newness of life. This is the victory of the gospel, and it's the victory that guarantees the second coming when He makes all things new. Church, are you living in light of this reality? The King is coming, and are you living like you're freed from guilt? Are you living like you're freed from the power of sin? This leads us to the fifth lesson. The king will comfort his people. The king will comfort his people. Look at verse 6. And he made us, he transformed us, he made us to be a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be the glory and dominion, forever and ever. Amen. This is comforting because if you are a kingdom now, you will receive the kingdom forever. If you are a priest now, you will enjoy His presence forever. And Jesus says right now He's made us to be a kingdom and priest to our God, and when He comes, all of our prayers, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, that will be reality. When the king comes, his reign will be here and immense and unhindered. And that is good news and great comfort to us. What does it mean to be a priest? What does it mean to be a priest of our God? Second, 1 Peter 2 tells us, it says, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. It's the same kind of language. A people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. A priest is someone who mediates. 
He mediates on behalf of God and for the people. What it means for you and me to be a priest is that we would mediate the message of the gospel to the world. Because here is the cold, hard reality. The cold, hard reality, as we talked last Sunday about Psalm 23 and about the comfort of Christ, and that is only comforting if you know Christ. It's comforting if the king is coming if you are already a kingdom. It's not comforting if you're not a part of the kingdom yet. And this leads to the sixth lesson that we can learn from this text, and that is the king will terrify others. The king will terrify others when he comes. Look at verse 7. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, And all the tribes, all of them, all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. The second coming is going to be a bone-chilling reality for the tribes of the earth. Jesus, the first coming, he came poor weak as a baby, in a smelly manger, unannounced. The second coming, he is coming with a loud trumpet. He is coming as a royal king. He is coming with his vast army of the saints. And he is coming not with a rod and a staff to comfort, But the book of Revelation describes him as coming with a sword on a horse, and his robe is dipped in blood, and that blood is not his own blood. That blood is the blood of his enemies that he slaughters. The lamb was already slaughtered, and now he's coming back to slaughter his enemies. The lamb was pierced. He was wounded for our transgressions and pierced for our iniquities. He was crushed. And he's not coming to be crushed again. Instead, he's coming to crush his foes. And everyone who has not repented and trust in Jesus alone for salvation. Revelation 6, let me read this to you. This is Revelation 6, 14 through 17. The sky was split apart like a scroll when it rolled up. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Then the kings of the earth (laughs) and the great men and the commanders and the rich, and the strong, and every slave, and every free man hid themselves in the caves and among the mountains. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? There will be mourning for everyone who has not bowed the knee to Jesus Christ at the second coming. And people will beg, they will beg for the rocks to fall upon them so that they don't have to face the wrath of God, but the rocks won't help them. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth that starts on that day and goes on forever. And here's the reality. You and I have a message that brings comfort. The only way that people won't weep on that last day is if they weep today for their sins. Blessed are those who mourn now, for they will be comforted. If you wait until then to mourn, you won't be comforted. You'll be crushed. And it is our job It is our duty to be priests to the world and to mediate God's message that the King is coming and we must repent. And so here I am. I am here today to tell you to repent of your sins and to trust in Jesus Christ alone because He loves you and He wants to free you from your sins and He died for you so that you could have life. But if you don't repent and believe today, then you won't know the comfort of His coming and you will only know His wrath. So please repent. Ask Jesus to forgive you and to cleanse you from your sin. 
This leads to the last lesson. Lesson number seven. The king is coming quickly. The king is coming quickly. We are running out of time. Look at verse three. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. He says this again at the end of Revelation, Revelation 22.10. Do not seal up the words of the prophecy, for the time is near. Jesus' last words, Revelation 22.20. He who testifies to these things says, I am coming quickly. I am coming quickly. We are running out of time. In 1925, the serum run took place in Alaska because thousands of people were in danger. They assembled these teams of relay races, and they risked their lives, and they drove into a fierce storm. And if you read about that, you can just Google this, and you can read about several accounts. And one of the, one of the stopping points, one of the checkpoints where um, one of the sledders came in, the mushers, he came in to the roadhouse, and it was so cold, they had to pour hot water over his hands in order to remove them from the sled. It was upwards of negative 60 and negative 80 degrees. Dogs on the sleds were dying during the journey. When they would arrive at the roadhouse, different, at different checkpoints, dogs would drop dead. One man, he was, it was so cold and the wind was so intense that he had to get off of his sled and run next to it so that he could keep his body temperature up. And by the time he arrived at the next relay point, he had frostbite on his face and his face was black and he had hypothermia. The last man, name was Gunner, who uh, came in to the town. As he was coming in, he, he was going so fast and felt such urgency that he skipped one of the checkpoints. And then he arrived at the next checkpoint, and the guy who was supposed to take the medicine on the next trip was asleep, and he felt such urgency that he kept on and didn't even wake the next runner because he wanted to get back in time to save the children. On that last leg, wind came and blew over his sled, and the medicine, which was wrapped up in this fur, fell out of the sled and into the snowdrift, and he had to take off his gloves so he could feel around, and he grabbed all over in the darkness to find the medicine, and he finally found it, but he had frostbite on his hands. When he arrived in town, he collapsed, and he gave the medicine, and they injected all the people who were infected, and in three weeks, they lifted the quarantine on the town. Those men felt an urgency. They felt the deadline of their loved ones. Brothers and sisters, we have a much more urgent mission than the 1925 serum run. We have a deadline that is way more serious than diphtheria. We have a deadline that should impact our lives and cause us to have boldness and have urgency and tell people the good news. And so I want to ask you, your time's running out. Where are you investing your time? When was the last time you planned to engage in love your reach contact? When was the last time you thought about your reach contact? Husbands, when was the last time you thought about investing and discipling your family? Your time's running out. Students, singles, you may be here and you may say, I got all the time in the world. You don't. You don't know that. Jesus could come, and He can come quickly, and you need to be prepared to meet Him, and you need to have a heart full of love and walk with Him. Where are you investing your time? Senior adults, maybe you're just coasting into retirement. You're just on the golf course. You're just cruising, and you're not thinking about the urgency of the mission. 
Invest in the next generation. Pick up the phone, call people, write them, love them. Be a church that pursues a multi-generational pursuit of godliness because the time is near. When, um, when I think about the return of Jesus, I grew up in a small country church. Actually, it, it grew and grew. By the time I left, it was larger, but it still felt like that country feel of home in Tennessee. And there was a song that I can't escape. It gets stuck in my head, and you know it, and uh, I love it. It's called The King is Coming. And that song is precious to me. Let me read you one of the stanzas here. The marketplace is empty. No more traffic in the streets. All the builders' tools are silent. No more time to harvest wheat. Busy housewives cease their labors. In the courtroom, no debate. Work on earth is all suspended as the king comes through the gate. Oh, the king is coming. The king is coming. I just heard the trumpet sounding, and now his face I see. Oh, the king is coming. The king is coming. Praise God, he's coming for me. Is he coming for you? Is he coming for your neighbor? Let's pray and ask God for mercy. Father, the song, The King is Coming, is only comforting if we know you. And so I pray, I pray if there's anyone here who's not trusting in Jesus, that during this time of response, that they would reach out for help, that they would reach out in faith, and they would believe upon you and be saved. And I pray that you would encourage us with great urgency as a church in light of your return. And we pray this in your name. Amen.